partly present some of the work that al Haq is doing as part of its accountability project, um, namely speaking about accountability of corporations that are complicit in violations of international law, including war crimes, in the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, and this is indeed a new frontier that, that is emerging. So there, we haven't had a lot of experience here, but um, it is of particular importance for the reasons that I'll, I'll try to, to present to you in the following. Um, and I'll use PowerPoint just to communicate some of the more technical detail possible. Um, that clear, so I'm happy to go back to some of these issues in the discussion, because I'll, I'll treat them very quickly. Um, I'd like to start by framing the discussion in a bit of a broader context, in the context in which a lot of the litigation, a lot of the international law uh, related work in the occupied Palestinian territory um, is going on. And that's particularly something that I, mean, I think a lot of you have heard about and discussed in, in some of the human rights classes, um, and that's the, the resistance, legitimacy, and lawfare terminology. Okay. In very simple, brief terms, what has happened in this discussion, I'll take this quote in a second, um, is that Palestinians have started using international law to forward their struggle, um, whilst pro-Israeli groups have demonized these actions, uh, and Israel has started engaging with international law in order to reclaim it by exploiting some of the gray areas. There's that dynamic there. At the same time, we have um, Israel and pro-Israeli groups reacting to the use of international law by Palestinians through insistent accusations that Palestinians are engaging in lawfare, okay, where international law has become a site for the conflict. And um, Elizabeth Sampson presents this particular uh, quandary, if you will, in the following terms. Lawfare is developed to combat terrorists' most enigmatic enemy. They are not fighting an occupier or challenging a military incursion. They are fighting the forces of freedom. They are fighting the voice of reason. And they are attacking those who have the liberty to speak and act openly. And the weapon that the enemy is using was created by our own hands. That is the rule of law. A weapon designed to subdue dictators and tyrants is now being misused to empower the very same and being manipulated to subvert real justice and indisputable truth. That is not the purpose the law is designed to serve. To share with you two more quotes that some of you may be familiar with. The first, Gerald Steinberg in the Israel Law Review responded to the advisory opinion in an article entitled War by Other Means. The advisory opinion is the opinion of the International Court of Justice in 2004 on the separation wall in the OPT, um, basically confirming that the settlements are illegal, the wall is illegal, and that the international community has a role to play um, to bring a stop to those violations. By stating, um, this is Steinberg, that the sort of legal system referred to as international law lacked the necessary legitimacy based on the constant, um, consent of the government. He concluded that the Kantian idealism of international law was being exploited routinely as a central part of the conflict itself in the service of realism's pursuit of power and influence as channeled through international institutions, the media, and a very powerful NGO network. Uh, largely subsidized by governments and other political bodies. Intent on delegitimizing the legitimate right to self-defense. Now that's Israel's position and reaction to the situation. Uh, Colonel Liebman, head of the Israeli military's international law department, actually former head at the moment, also stated that war crimes uh, charges brought abroad against Israeli soldiers and officers involved and Operation Castlet are nothing but legal terrorism. So this is the situation. I won't, I won't touch upon Samson's categories of lawfare. Uh, we could look at that later, possibly. So there is this uh, legitimization campaign that Israel has engaged in for uh, a number of years now as a result of this uh, advocacy 
work and the use of international law in courtrooms in the UN, in the EU, by the, the civil society in Palestine. The importance of the use of litigation in this particular context is highlighted by, by the fact that Israel has managed to create uh, a normal situation, has normalized its um, actions, and the resistance to this normalization, to this business as usual environment that is created for corporations, for other states and its international relations, diplomatic, commercial, and so forth, um, is being challenged precisely by this apolitical, more neutral terminology of the law. That's where the corporate accountability comes in in the context of other lawsuits. And that's precisely where, in this context of Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, there is um, a growing importance for this to be the main tool used by activists, um, if you will, by lawyers, by NGOs, rather than the other means, the moral language, the political language that has been used so far and has not been uh, effective. Um, to add to this, generally speaking, um, I think that a lot of you are familiar with the situation uh, on the ground and the fact that there is a very serious account accountability gap uh, in the region. Israeli courts have failed to provide effective remedies. <coughs> They're biased inherently. Most of the judgments, and, and there's a recent report that al haq published um, this, this past year on how the, the High Court of Justice, the Israeli Supreme Court, legitimizes a lot of Israel's actions in occupied territory. Um, and gives them a rubber, uh, a rubber stamp, a legal, formal um, face, legalizing, basically, <coughs> in the audience of the international community, what the state is doing. There is a growing engagement with international law on behalf of Israeli institutions locally, but obviously the, the, the projection is in international, it's towards the international community. So, to start a little bit of a technical discussion, um, and I hope I don't alienate any of you, to try to be as didactic as possible. Um, we have to understand, first of all, the legal framework applicable in occupied territory in the OPT, um, in order to understand why corporations, how corporations could be seen as complicit, and what they're complicit in. Um, first of all, the OPT is occupied territory under international humanitarian law. And the law of belligerent occupation applies there, which uh, simply, uh, simply said is international humanitarian law and human rights law. And there's a recent report by the uh, Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa, it was written by a group of academics and practitioners. Uh, that covers not only that legal framework of the law of occupation, but also looks at the prohibitions of colonialism and apartheid um, as international law that has also become applicable in the context of the Palestinian situation. Uh, and of course, there's a huge significance to the application of that kind of language in legal terms in this context. Um, particularly with regards to, to the reaction of the international community that is called upon. On top of that, we have the general principles of public international law that apply to non-state actors. And corporations are seen as non-state actors in international law. There's a question of legal personality there, which is a bit too technical. We won't go into that. In scholarly debates, it's much more developed than it is in practice. So you won't see McDonald's being treated like Hezbollah, uh, but effectively in, in the law they, they are. They have a very similar legal personality. And that's being developed by the practice that corporate um, lawsuits are um, producing. Another layer to this framework, a much softer layer that isn't being uh, enforced effectively, but is constantly being developed the UN Special Rapporteur on Business and Human, and Human Rights recently published a report um, on the, the last element there, Protect, Respect, and Remedy Framework, 
there are various guidelines on how business and corporate social uh, responsibility needs to, um, needs to function. The, these, are the, um, these are the standards by which corporations are held to account. This is um, the report, the recent report, which I very much recommend you to look at. Uh, because it, it really approaches these, these debates from a legal point of view, desensitizing them from a lot of the kind of uh, the language that has been taken hostage to some extent by the political debate. <clears throat> so the first question is how corporations become complicit. The type of activities that generally, and, and this is not exhaustive, um, that corporations are involved in that makes them responsible, whether by aiding and abetting or actually by conspiring with the state in the commission of, of its war crimes. And we're not talking about what kind of war crimes Israel is committing here yet, but, um, but I think I'm taking that for granted almost. If there are questions on that, we can, we can uh, look at that later. <coughs> Arms deals. So as far as the UK was concerned, we'll look at one of the cases we submitted where um, the UK was uh, accused of helping Israel in, a, in the war crimes it committed in, in Gaza, in the war in Gaza, because of the arms deals the UK um, has with, with Israel. Illegal produce. There's many com foreign companies that operate in settlements, that have factories in settlements, that extract uh, various uh, natural resources from settlements, supermarkets by selling goods from settlements, uh, oil and gas, British gas for, for a long time was involved in exploiting gas in the Gaza Strip. That was a tender that was given to it by the Israeli government. And so on. There's quite a few examples. Areas of concern. There are three main categories. And I'm trying to be systematic to, to give you a broader picture of the the variety of the, the types of cases that we're dealing with. One is Israeli companies, the Israeli companies that are actually working with the state um, in exploiting the Palestinian economy and workforce, uh, in setting up their factories and farms in land that was appropriated unlawfully, private land, in occupied territory. Um, and the international dimension here is that, for example, of the most the most recent case, the, the advantages that were granted to a lot of these companies, the, the export of their products uh, abroad, um, in the context of the EU-Israel uh, Association Agreement, the trade agreement that gives certain preferential trade um, benefits to a lot of goods that come out of Israel and go to EU countries, were also uh, granted to settlement products. Uh, now, the European Court of Human Rights in February 2010 issued a decision saying that, and that was a Brita soda club, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with soda club, um, decision that all settlement produce um, is illegal, should not be sold, in fact, but to the extent that the agreement applies to that produce, it should not uh, apply to it. Right? It has applied. Now, the other Recommendations in that decision include um, states taking action to make sure that certificates of origin in each one of the member states um, look at where those goods are coming from. A lot of the time it says made in Israel, but it isn't. Um, and furthermore, that supermarkets, large chains, look at what goods they're selling on their shelves um, to regulate those um, those steps in the, in the consumption and the distribution uh, of these goods uh, has been very difficult. So in fact, there's a decision, but it hasn't trickled down to that extent. So in this kind of situation, in fact, you have, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of work on the divestment sanctions campaign, the BDS campaign, which complements the type of litigation work um, that, that we are doing uh, by enforcing those, those judgments, those decisions. The third, uh, sorry, the second category, international corporations, I've, I've mentioned, we'll speak about a little bit further. Um, and third states. Third states have a particular role in um, 
supporting Israel, whether it's commercially or um, diplomatically. And uh, a number of foreign governments have also been involved in setting up industrial zones uh, in, in settlements. So they have uh, an official role in, uh, in, that, in, in that production, in, in the actual illegal act. So we'll look at that in a second. I don't want to, to jump further. I think I have a couple of examples of the companies here. Um, Ahava Dead Sea Laboratories, Carmel, Veolia, Cement Road Holdings, Irish, Caterpillar, Elbit Systems, Finnish, G4S, uh, Security Company, um, English, and there's a much longer list. But if you're interested in, in specifically these companies were covered more recently uh, by the Russell Tribunal in Palestine, which is a people's tribunal that took place in London. Um, the last session was in London, but there are three sessions on Palestine. Uh, the first was in Barcelona, and the third will be in South Africa, I believe in March. Um, all, uh, all of these sessions have been looking at corporate complicity in one way or another, and the witnesses and the experts have provided very detailed information about the roles of these, uh, these and other companies in uh, the occupation in violations of, of international law. Uh, of course, there's no prosecution there. It's a people's tribunal with a jury um, consisting of experts that give their legal opinion on the situation, but the, the action is to be taken by, by lawyers, like all lawyers, for example. The type of remedies that are available against corporate complicity. So once we've established that there is involvement, that there is either a, an international company or an Israeli company that, that is getting benefits, where, where does that kind of case go? So there are two main avenues. There are the civil suits and there are the criminal prosecutions. Um, and these are based on a mix of the domestic law, uh, the money laundering law, the concealment law, and uh, the commission of war crimes. So that, that being also part of the domestic legislation, but it's transposed domestic legislation. It's international law that had become part of the, um, the national law at some stage. The civil suits are based on, on tort or non-contractual obligations. Criminal prosecutions are uh, mainly based on war crimes acts, so domestic legislation implementing the Geneva Conventions and listing rape breaches in the Geneva Conventions as those that are prosecutable in domestic courts. Now, the standard that we're looking at specifically applicable to, to the corporation or to the directors of the corporation um, is whether they were knowingly providing practical assistance, encouragement, or moral support that has a substantial effect on the commission of the crime. Um, and the knowledge and proximity elements are the, the most important ones that we're looking to, to provide evidence on. Um, again, possibly this, this kind of legal discussion can take place afterwards. Another important point to make here is that there's constantly, within the various categories of war crimes, developments with regards to the way the crime uh, is defined. What kind of crime are we talking about? Uh, because there's a very there's the traditional list of, um, of grave breaches in the Geneva Conventions that some of you are familiar with, the definition of a war crime, um, or a crime against humanity. But there's constantly different ways of understanding the type of activity that are going on. So in terms of the evolving legal arguments, one of the most recent developments um, is the framing of settlement produce as pillage. Um, and we, we could discuss that if you want a bit further, but we're just moving on. <clears throat> Except for the courtrooms, and, I, and I've mentioned so far that we're using mainly uh, domestic national laws and domestic um, courts to actually litigate. Uh, there are other mechanisms that are called in this, in this case 
passive enforcement mechanisms, you can call that uh, pre-litigation uh, measures, um, and they involve enforcing the, those very same standards of human rights and international law on those companies through the kinds of uh, codes of conduct that they've already adhered to. Um, so here we have voluntary codes of conduct that the corporation has uh, professed to, um, to comply with, and it's, it's signed those, uh, those kind of uh, codes, and consumer regulations, which are enforced by a regulatory authority in the particular uh, jurisdiction um, where, the, where the company is domiciled. To move on to the actual work of the accountability project, and here I'll, I'll look at two specific cases that we've treated um, in the recent years, give you an example of how, um, of how these cases are framed. First of all, the, the whole accountability project deals with three areas. Okay. <clears throat> the first area is the individual criminal responsibility. Um, allegation. Um, this is traditionally the kind of cases that you hear about when arrest warrants for high political um, and military officials are issued. Uh, in, in the UK more, most recently, before in Belgium, there were attempts in Spain. Um, and I'm sure you're all very aware of the fact that universal jurisdiction laws are heavily politicized uh, they're very often ineffective uh, because uh, politics come in at a very early stage and it's also very difficult to even issue the arrest warrant, let alone enforce, uh, enforce it or even start the substantive discussion, the substantive hearings on the case. Um, I believe there's a list here of the, amount of, the number of cases that have been uh, <coughs> submitted by various, or not just the hot, various organizations and bodies in, in different countries. Not to list, not to actually read them, but I'll, I'll just keep that as an option to return to possibly later. Um, another huge avenue with, with regards to individual criminal responsibility has been uh, the use, the attempt to use the International Criminal Court. Um, this is something I'm, I'm sure not a lot of you are familiar with, and I don't want to, to sidetrack into the discussion of, of Palestine and the ICC, but shortly after the Gaza uh, war, the Palestinian Ministry of Justice issued a declaration to the court asking it to use its jurisdiction, to invoke its jurisdiction um, with regards to what happened in Palestine since the court was established, uh, which is July 2002. Um, now, the court is deliberating the question as we speak. There are a lot of politics involved, clearly, but there is a very strong case to be answered. Uh, the main issue being, as far as the court is concerned, um, whether Palestine is a state for the purpose of the Rome Statute, the court's um, founding statute, and whether it can then ask the court to, to act within its jurisdiction, whether it can even transfer its jurisdiction to the court. Uh, but that's a very interesting discussion that I do encourage you to, to look at um, because it effectively will be, although it's symbolic justice, um, it's, uh, it's a very important avenue for this kind of situation um, where you don't have uh, national justice mechanisms where universal jurisdiction cases are often politicized and countries are starting to ch change their laws as, as we go. There's a, there's a, very strong domino effect, um, and where corporate accountability cases are still not um, the most effective, although the more palpable um, avenue, as you'll see, there are various complications here as well. I mentioned the other two, that's why I'm skipping corporate responsibility, we'll discuss in second responsibility of third states, um, is is another area which I'll skip. I think what we can discuss that. It's actually there was an actual lawsuit that Al Haq submitted against the UK government, maybe interesting to some of you, um, demanding the government uh, to denounce Israel's unlawful acts, to suspend its arms deals, uh, to um, 
to spend all other financial military assistance and so on and so forth, that all is based on that standard of international law which, um, which ob obligates third states to uh, abstain at the very least from having any kind of relations from, a, from a, a state that violates the most supreme norms of international law, which is indeed the case of Israel, um, but also, in fact, to take positive measures to bring those, those violations to an end. Um, I'll skip over this as well. I think I'm coming right close to my time. So the two cases we'll, we'll look at, and again, briefly, just to understand the kind of arguments that are brought, are one, Bil'in um, versus Green Park. Bil'in is a village near Ramallah, um, and Green Park is a Canadian construction company. This case is a civil liability case, and the next one we'll look at uh, is a criminal liability case. So this case was filed in July 2008, before the Superior Court <coughs> Um, against these two construction companies. And the legal claim was that the companies were effectively not only um, commissioned to construct, but also to market and sell the residential units in a huge settlement um, on the land of this village um, that was appropriated unlawfully, because a lot of it is private land, and the appropriations went on for years, because the settlement actually was expanded further and further. Um, and this legal claim is based on, <clears throat> as is here, GC4, Geneva, the Fourth Geneva Convention, uh, the transfer of the occupying powers uh, population into occupied territory. It's a grave breach, and it's a war crime under the Rome Statute, and also under Canada's Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act. The remedy, the remedy that was demanded was compensation for, for injury. Um, this is a bit of a visual as to how much, uh, about 60 to 70 percent of this village's land um, was taken, uh, and there uh, you can see that that huge blue area is uh, the biggest today settlement, um, or one of the biggest, I may say, um, in the West End, more than the an ultra orthodox settlement with um, close to 120,000 residents, illegal settlers. Um, in August 2010, the Court of Quebec, uh, the Court of Appeal, refused its jurisdiction on the grounds of form non-convenience. Form non-convenience means that the court said that uh, it is not the appropriate jurisdiction um, to deliberate the case and that the Israeli court should be looking at this case. Now, I should note that within the context of the case, we submitted, together with uh, Canadian Council, um, expert opinions and extensive, uh, extensive evidence to show that Israeli courts have um, conclusively rejected uh, the discussion of the legality of settlements. That is a non-justiciable matter in Israeli courts. There's absolutely no possibility of submitting that kind of claim. Um, nevertheless, the court, the court uh, made this, this, took this decision, and in October we filed an application uh, before the Supreme Court to grant permission to appeal, um, and the case is still pending. So this is an example of one of the kind of avoidance techniques, if you will, that are used by courts in these situations where uh, politics are involved, um, but uh, of course that in the Canadian situation, was not the, um, the obvious thing for the court to use. In the, in the case of Caterpillar, that some of you may have heard of, um, in the US, that, that was the argument. There, there's what is called the political question doctrine that the courts use as a sort of legal argument to say that this is not a, a legal matter. We will not deliberate the question because it, it's not um, it's not something that, that's up to the court to decide, it's politics. Uh, and that's why the U.S. courts are also not a, a possible jurisdiction for Palestinian cases. That, that avenue has been blocked for, for the, even for corporate cases. The next case... The next case um, that 
I'll look at very quickly the, is a criminal liability case against um, Rual in, uh, that was submitted just very recently and that we're actually working on at the moment um, against the company and its directors, and this is in the Netherlands. Um, in March 2010, after we submitted this case, I should, sorry, I should say, go, go back and kind of race forward. This company um, specializes in providing mobile cranes and aerial platforms, and it provided this equipment to the Ministry of Defense when it was constructing <clears throat> the wall. Um, and I can just show you a couple of photographs before we go back. Um, in 2005, 2006, those are its cranes, Dutch company, um, and here. And then in 2009, we also saw it in settlement. <clears throat> so in March, the Dutch prosecutor filed charges against the company and actually raided the company's offices, um, claiming not to have found anything. So Dutch courts probably are, are least blunt in their, in their approach, but they've claimed so far to, to not be able to do much in order to, to forward the investigation. There's no, there have not been any disclosure warrants. The company is not obligated to, to answer any case at this stage. The legal claim uh, was the aiding and abetting in unlawful destruction and appropriation of land. So it's not just providing frames to the Israeli government. It has to be framing of how it aided and abetted in the commission of a war crime. Um, and the appropriation of land was the for the construction of the wall and its involvement in illegal settlements. Again, in Holland, there's Holland, uh, the International Crimes Act. It's national legislation, but it's uh, tra transposing the international law into national law. <coughs> and um, in terms of the knowingly, if you recall what we discussed earlier, the standard uh, is that the company needs to know of its activities. Right, because providing equipment all over the world, maybe one cannot expect it to go and regulate what that equipment is being used for. Well, we took quite a few pre-litigation steps. We informed the company in 2006 and 2007. We also got the Dutch foreign minister involved in these communications <coughs> to let it know that its, that it's equipment is being used in, um, in illegal acts. So, in October, the Dutch the Dutch National Crime Squad searched its offices and the prosecutor is currently deliberating the case when the most crucial element to be established is its substantial involvement in the Dutch law, as we've understood, um, despite the fact that, as I've showed you, the company's equipment was involved in the construction um, of the wall in three different locations over the span of uh, those years. It's not clear if it was really for that long, but the question still stands with regards to whether the case will, will be opened, um, and that will be premised on whether it was substantially involved uh, in those activities. So one could also frame that as a way of, um, of softly avoiding the actual matter, because it, it, it shouldn't, that should not stop a war crimes. Uh, case from, from going forward, from being actually opened and substantively deliberated. That should not be a way to, to close um, th this kind of uh, lawsuit. Okay, no time. How much time do I have? Okay. This is just to, to mention in passing, um, the most recent case that we're actually examining, um, and it's this is this is where where things are happening on the ground. Um, there's a fast train being built between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and this is that being the West Bank, the occupied West Bank. Um, this train line crosses the West Bank uh, in two places, and six kilometers effectively of it goes through occupied territory. Um, and in order to be able to construct that, of course, the Israeli government had to appropriate land, and a lot of it was private land, which is, by definition, unlawful appropriation. 
in terms of the law of occupation. Um, and in order to do the tunneling work there, because it's quite a hilly area, it's using foreign companies um, in their expertise and know-how um, in tunneling. And these companies include a German state-owned uh, train company, a Russian state-owned train company, as well as uh, an Italian one. So there are, in fact, two ways that this case could be approached. Right? The state-owned company could be litigated against uh, through the state, so submitting a case, a case against the state, because it's uh, analogous to the provision of, of arms, arms deals, and, and uh, war crimes of this kind are, are indistinguishable to some extent in international law. Um, and, uh, and then to litigate against the corporation itself in one of those jurisdictions. Um, and we're looking at those cases at the moment, particularly the Italian. To finish, I guess to finish, with some um, remarks on how things have been going so far and why, nevertheless, it's, it's important that we continue in this particular path. Um, one of the things that I think I've mentioned a number, a number of times in this, in this talk has been this, uh, the, the meticulous factual work that is being done on a regular basis in order to monitor the activities of of these companies, um, apart from the obvious legal uh, analysis that is being conducted. But the, the type of pre-litigation steps that need to be taken in a lot of these cases are quite arduous. So a case could take years. Um, and so the, that delay of justice uh, also, of course, um, creates a problem in terms of evidence, because a lot of evidence is often lost and a lot of Prosecutors, domestic part, like the Dutch prosecutor, for example, which is looking back to 2005, uh, is unable to find a lot of these documents. A lot of these contracts are no longer readily available to us. Um, generally speaking, foreign prosecutors are weird, you know, in cases like this because of the politics behind it. So there are a number of avoidance techniques that we've that we've seen, whether it's the national courts or the national prosecutor has used either for non-convenience, go to the Israeli courts, the political question doctrine, uh, restriction on class action, so whether it's al haq submitting it or a Palestinian village submitting the case, that may be problematic. So in the Canadian courts, for example, we have the head the, of the village council in Berlin. He submitted the case on behalf of, of his family, the land that was appropriated from them. Uh, there's a very high threshold, generally, um, for penetrating the corporate veil, which means in order to reverse the presumption and force the corporation to answer the case and disclose documents and prove that it hasn't really knowingly been involved in those actions, <clears throat> you have to show that there's probable cause. And to show that probable cause, it often uh, takes research and, and factual uh, investigative work that NGOs do not have the resources to do, uh, and national prosecutors are unwilling to do. Um, so effectively, we are left with what is the unconventional success story. And it goes much beyond the kind of work that, that is being done on individual criminal responsibility cases, uh, but the success uh, is mainly the deterrent effect that we managed to create in a lot of these cases. The kind of public critique that has been produced um, and definitely the, uh, the jeopardizing the commercial activities of a lot of these companies um, internationally because the, the monitoring uh, done by advocacy groups has shown that these companies uh, have definitely been defamed to a large extent. Um, so the bringing of legal action is definitely the most fertile um, area at the moment as an avenue for, for accountability for victims. Um, although there's no compensation, although there's no legal um, action in terms of a prosecution, in terms of a conviction, uh, there's definitely um, much more legal force in ensuring that international law is the standard for those actors, whether non-state or state, and a lot, a lot of the times there's support from the state for, the, for these multinational um, corporations that 
international law will, will be the standard by which they will be judged and that there will be a lawsuit if they choose to, to get involved in, in this particular region and in the, act, in the activities of the Israeli government, um, which, of course, uh, is nevertheless violating international law despite the kind of facade, political facade that it's managed to keep um, on the whole. So whereas the lawfare accusations are unlikely to end in the short term, um, a commitment to this rigorous scholarship and activism based on international law will be the, of increasing significance and it is the, um, the way that the world will become more conscious, uh, conscious of, of giving more attention to this kind of situation. That, that is what, what we have at the moment and I think that it's definitely something that we're recognizing uh, that we need to be using more. Thank you. Thank you. Possibly be also relevant to aiding and abetting the, the, the act, the illegal act of the there. I guess that, that's a legalistic discussion. I don't know if you're, if you're interested in, in that level of technicality. Okay. What if the state has no relation to the company uh, in the case they were put in? Could the state sue? So the state being Israel in this case? No, the state, for example, if it's a German, uh, a German company, uh, the German uh, government could sue them. They, they are effectively doing that. What we have in the case of um, the Dutch Rival is that the Dutch prosecutor is suing the Dutch company. Um, and I wanted to, I mean, to use an anecdote, actually, a lot of the money that is being used for these, for these uh, corporate accountability cases is coming from the Dutch government. Uh, so as part of this, this whole um, campaign uh, that is being launched by pro-Israeli groups, um, organizations
organizations such as Al-Haq and others have been targeted recently um, by NGO Monitor, amongst others, uh, claiming that uh, we're basically, they've actually, sorry, they've actually addressed our donors and addressed the Dutch government to say, well, look, there's a problem here. You're, getting, you're giving money to organizations to sue your companies. <clears throat> so there definitely is a sometimes triangular relationship. The state is sometimes contributing to its own problems and is suing its, or, its own uh, its own companies, um, but reluctantly, definitely, because at the moment we're not we're not sure where that's going to, to go. And, and in other cases, um, in the Canadian courts, we've managed to maneuver out of it thus far. It's still pending, but um, things are not looking out. Maybe as a corollary, but a general question. Um, given what you said about the um, maybe some of the unintended results of applying international law and pursuing this as the most fertile avenue, as you put it, and given the response of a lot of um, foreign governments, Canadian, German, Dutch, in uh, bypassing, let's say, or not maybe taking a serious issue with some of the um, cases being brought under the umbrella of international law. What do you think, in your opinion, does that say about the state of international law, if you could comment a bit on that um, idea? I mean, clearly there's something interesting at work where, you know, the law, I mean, you say, if we can hold everybody, you know, Israel, the state of Israel, among other um, countries, to the standard, of international law, but clearly that standard is not reachable, maybe, or, um, can you just talk a little bit about that? To try to avoid giving Steinberg's comments any um, validity, uh, he was the one, many others who said that the international legal is not a legal system, um, it's idyllic, it's unenforceable, there's absolutely no way to, to use it effectively. And I think that what we've been doing and the reaction that, that the Israeli government has, um, has had over the last couple of years is, has showed quite the opposite. So whether it's a question of legitimacy or reputation, um, and, and not necessarily the kind of traditional prosecution, getting people in prison or arrested, uh, or getting compensation, which, which is what would happen in, in murder or, or tort claims in, in, um, in the national context, there, there are consequences. And there, there are consequences that the Israeli government is, um, is actually being affected, if not suffering, from at the moment. Um, Goldstone uh, has taken a life of its own. It's, it's almost a dirty word to some extent. And, and Israel has, <clears throat> if, if at least, just used an exorbitant amount of resources to forward that PR campaign uh, to make sure that international law is, uh, is used in every possible context where it may fear some kind of attack. Um, and to, we previously discussed this uh, with, with Tom, to make sure that they document every single act uh, of war or every single act of, of foreign policy even. Um, <clears throat> and hold that before anyone else does preemptively to the standard of international law in order to reclaim it. Um, and I, th I think it actually, interestingly enough, it has not happened as much in terms of corporate accountability. I mean, on the general level, yes, because corporate accountability basically um, legalizes the whole boycott um, discussion using the terms of, of the law. Commercial activity will also be held to that same standard. It's not only about um, attacking uh, civilians or, or um, you know, acts of war, military operations. It's also about any kind of diplomatic or commercial help that is given to a country that sustains that kind of regime. Yeah. If I could piggyback onto Daniel's question, um, if you sort of 
think about the, the very successes that al Haq has had. Are there particular uh, branches of international law that have facilitated or made it easier for the organization to, you know, to successfully get justice, uh, given that a lot of the problem is, is about um, you know, lack of international recognition of the Palestinian state? So I guess another way of putting the question would be, are there any branches of international law that are less dependent on the assumption of an international system? If mm -hmm. that makes sense. The system of nation states. Mm -hmm. Right? So international law, you have to balance always between the sovereignty of the various nation states and their desire to want to cooperate in order to facilitate mm -hmm. trade and you know also maintain sovereignty. So are there any, you know, branches of international law um, that that are particularly well suited, um, you know, or not well suited, but allow more opportunity than other branches of international law in pursuing Palestinian justice? Mm -hmm. The easy, the easy answer is yes, but um, it's probably a bit. But a few things that you raised there, Palestinian statehood and so on and so forth. Um, the answer to the last point is yes, there are branches which which are definitely easier to, to pursue. Um, and going back to that distinction between you know, pursuing state actors is much more political and politicized uh, than pursuing non-state actors because they don't. Such as corporations. Corporations. Maybe. Although they go non-state actors, as I mentioned earlier, is, is you know, Hezbollah is also a non-state actor, uh, and it's, it will be held to the same to the same legal standard. Um, although in, in scholarly debates, it's still different than it is in practice. Corporations are becoming um, more vulnerable to those to those same kind of lawsuits, and it's, it's definitely an emerging field, also with NGOs elsewhere and in other situations. We're not unique in that in that sense. Uh, with regards to to you mentioned Palestinian statehood and, and maybe there's there's a bit of a link to yeah, the law international law of states and traditionally international law applies to states and it's very difficult to, to distance those principles that developed in a, a Westphalian environment mm -hmm. um, to to the kind of developing modern practices where there is a fragmentation of actors and sources of, of the law um, and, a, and a very different um, environment. For example, with regards to, to the, the judicial forums or the legal forums where the law will be enforced, it's much more likely that we'll end up in a domestic court than we end up in an international court. Um, and it's even more likely that we'll be able to enforce international law through soft mechanisms that are non-judicial um, and uh, be able to influence the behavior of the, the various the actors that we're, we're looking at. Um, but when it comes to statehood and, and the question of recognition of Palestinian statehood, which has been very important and with regards to the International Criminal Court, but also with regards to the general status of the Palestinian Authority and the negotiations and the, the whole uh, this, the question of representation, whether the Palestinian people are effectively represented by the PA in, in the various peace talks, um, which are in and of themselves inherently problematic legally, morally, and so forth. Um, the, the surge in recognition, which maybe a number of you taken note of that in the last few months there's been a whole wave of recognitions by uh, countries in the in the southern hemisphere possibly mainly, but more recently there have been diplomatic up upgrades in Europe as well. Um, the PLO missions have now become um, embassies uh, and before they were representative offices. So that kind of complements the, the kind of recognition generally Palestinians are, and Palestinian uh, claims are, are getting in the international community, and I think that's heavily based on their uh, legal activism uh, to one extent, and the fact that 
they've, um, they've resorted to those more uh, apolitical, objectively recognizable means where their claims have more, um, I think to, to a great extent, more and more force. It's very difficult not to, to um, accept them, to, to, rec to recognize their validity, the right to self-determination, the, the right to, to statehood, and so forth. And it's something, I mean, to, to use another anecdote, in fact, uh, when the Oslo Accords were, were concluded, the, the PLO did not have lawyers, or anything. They, were, they saw themselves, and, and they were seen as you know, that guerrilla organization when there was no time for lawyers. Um, and, and that was a fundamental mistake. Mm -hmm. everyone, everyone knows that now. So that kind of shift in, in paradigms and approaches is, is definitely materialized in, in the reactions of, of countries and, and different bodies around. Is that shift, um, do you see it as a continuum from, let's say, uh, guerrilla resistance, political struggle, so on uh, into the domain of the law, or is it a break? Because sometimes you talk about, in your talk, uh, and in our conversations, you there's a very strong opposition between law and politics. Um, but other times it seems like the law is politics continued by a or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Is it just both, or how do you how do you see that? I would say the latter, absolutely. Um, I think that nevertheless. And, and we make those kind of claims very often, we as in civil society practitioners, NGOs, so forth, that law is the more uh, objective, neutral, apolitical standard. I think that's not fallacious. I don't think that's wrong to say that. But I think that, you know, theoretically, um, academically, it would be incorrect to just make that statement without further challenging it. And def definitely, there, there is politicization of you know, those various practices that seem um, on their face to, to, to grant certain uh, procedures uh, that are almost <coughs> automatic, that allow for, if you checklists are, are, um, are fulfilled, you'll get that result, but it's not as formulaic as, as, as one expects, because even within those formulas, you, you know, cross the T's and cross the I's, you're, you're still so if there's a non-pejorative use of the word lawfare, would you would that would you accept that as a description of what these what's involved here? I really don't like that word, so I don't know if I would accept right. that word, but I would definitely accept the the understanding of, of this particular um, situation. I don't even want to say new battle grounds. But this particular situation has, yes, we're using international law as resistance. That this, these are the new means for resistance. And we all perfectly recognize that. Um, because you know, when we define justice and accountability for victims and, and holding perpetrators to justice, this, this is not it. And it's not the, um, it's, it's not granting